Good afternoon. I want to thank everybody for logging in uh, to our webinar today. Uh, we're going to, if I have a guest speaker with us, uh, Mr. John Schaub, who's going to talk a little bit about some advanced investing strategies. Um, he's previewing a class that he has coming up uh, in the next few weeks here in Tampa. And so during the presentation today, uh, he's going to share some thoughts with us, give a little bit of preview of that, and certainly take some questions as well. Now, I have prepared some questions for John uh, to answer, but if you have questions as we go through today, uh, on your chat box on the screen, you can simply type your question into that chat box, and as it comes up, it's something certainly we will address with John uh, and have him answer for us. So again, if you're participating here live in the seminar today, you have the opportunity to ask some questions, just simply type it into the chat box on your screen. My name is Scott Maurer. I'm the Director of Business Development here with Advanta IRA. I'm also a licensed attorney, although I don't do any legal work for Advanta clients. Um, I think my legal background maybe gives me a better understanding of some of the things that we talk about from time to time uh, when it comes to self-directed IRA accounts. Uh, and just a quick disclaimer on our company is we do not provide investment advice and we don't endorse any particular products. So if we're talking about in one of our seminars or webinars about different types of investments, we're really making people just aware of the possibilities, not saying you should or should not do any particular uh, investment or avenue within uh, your particular account. If you need advice, uh, you can talk to your friends, uh, CPAs, attorneys, etc., to get more investment advice uh, regarding your account. A quick background on our company, we have been around since 2004. Uh, our only thing we do at Advance IRA is we administer self-directed IRA funds. The money has to be an IRA or has to be some type of retirement fund, some kind of qualified money. We are not permitted to hold and we don't hold any money that is not an IRA or is not retirement funds. Um, and again, the only thing that we do is administer and record keep that account. So we are not going to sell any investments. We're not going to promote any investments. We simply invest at the client's direction. If you're investing in real estate, private notes, private mortgages, et cetera, we just make sure that the paperwork gets handled correctly, the processes follows the right uh, way as well, just to make sure that the, ca the tax ramifications uh, do not accrue to your IRA. The benefits, obviously, of investing through an IRA, whether it's real estate or m mutual funds, is the ability to have those gains be tax deferred within the account. And just for those on the call who maybe are, are new to self-directed IRAs, why haven't you heard about them in the past? Uh, very simply, I think the main reason most people have not heard of the ability to invest in alternative assets is simply that most IRA accounts are administered by banks and brokerage firms which are offering you uh, limited investment products. They sell mutual funds, they sell stocks. Uh, they could allow you to invest in real estate and some of the things we'll talk about today. Uh, they just choose not to. Uh, IRS regulations do allow for a very broad range of investments. and I would encourage you to sit in on one of our other seminars or webinars um, you know, in the near future that addresses maybe more of the basics of self-directed IRA accounts. Again, today's seminar primarily is going to be uh, talking with John Schaub and his thoughts on some advanced strategies in regards to investing. And just here's the class that John is kind of previewing for us today. Um, class is coming up on Saturday and Sunday of April 25th and 26th. It's going to be held at the Tampa Airport Holiday Inn. Um, you can register at johnschaub.com. Um, there's a certain amount per person or for two registering together. I think a discount as well if you register soon. Uh, a lot of times we will, uh, it, it, Advanced IRA participates and sponsors this event, which we will be doing. We will be there on Saturday the 25th. Uh, so if you have questions for us, obviously there, we'll be on hand to, to answer those as well. Um, as we go through the questions again, if you have any questions that you'd like answered, simply type them into the chat box. I see a great one of, a, one has already come up and hopefully some more uh, will come as well. Um, so let me get to that first question. John, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Very good. Um, just start off. I know your, your class coming up. Give me just a quick uh, overview of maybe what's what you're going to be talking about before we go into some specific questions. Well, it, uh, it's hard to give you a quick overview. I mean, we're, we're breaking it down into four sections. Uh, there are advanced strategies for buying, for selling, for financing, and for exchanging. So we're, we're, we're uh, going to be speaking to an audience that, that has some experience in investing. This is not a class for brand new people. This is a class for folks who have bought some property and now they're trying to do a better job with uh, uh, you know, making more profits per deal, uh, better cash flow, uh, pay less in taxes, lower their risk, that type of thing. So it, it's for people who, uh, who are in the business and uh, who, who want to improve their business. 
And Peter and I, of course, each have about 40 years' experience doing this, and, and we've been through a lot of ups and downs, a lot of, uh, lot of economic cycles. Uh, so we, we have quite a bit of experience in, in, uh, in risk protection, and, and, uh, and, and I'm not talking about uh, asset protection now. I'm talking about making making good decisions so you're not at risk because you can't predict the future. We, we just had a Ben Bernanke speak here in town, and it was pretty funny. The uh, you know He did a great job, I thought, and talked a lot about uh, how they've managed that last financial crisis and, and what caused it and how to anticipate the next one. But uh, the newspaper the next day said, but he didn't tell us what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> and I said, you know, if he could tell us what's going to happen in the future, he probably wouldn't be speaking to any place. He'd just be buying stocks if he knew, because uh, nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. And that, that's why you're, if you're in this business, you, you need to always uh, be protecting yourself against downturns or protecting yourself against, uh, not protecting, but be, being taken taking advantage of, of uh, you know, run-ups in the market. And uh, so, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a learning experience. So the longer we're in this business, the more we learn about it, and, and we're, we're happy to share. Great. And, John, uh, one question came up right away from a participant. I'm going to go ahead and probably answer. I don't know. It's going to be more directed to me, but you can share your thoughts as well. But the person asked, if you're getting started, with a self-directed IRA, uh, is it best to transfer a small amount to us in preparation for a deal? And just on the IRA side of things, I think that helps a lot for clients if you're looking at uh, getting started with a self-directed IRA. You can do multiple transfers of money between IRA accounts. So a lot of times individuals will set up an account with us and transfer over just a little bit of money to get the account open. That does help you when you do find that deal if you need to put a contract in on a piece of real estate. Uh, we have the wording in place. We can have the, some of the funds to issue, issue for an escrow deposit, and you can always transfer more money later on. So to answer that gentleman's question, uh, I think it can make sense to start with a little bit uh, at front. If you do, haven't specified the actual property you're buying yet, uh, at least get the account open and get some funds transferred over to us uh, in preparation for a deal. I don't know, John, if you have anything you want to add to that or not, um, or else we can con continue going on with the questions. No, I, you know, I think that, that makes sense to me. And I, I taught a class for years that was titled Making It Big on Little Deals, and I would encourage people to, you know, to make their first couple of deals, especially little deals, make them small, because you learn an awful lot uh, from any any transaction you're involved in. So your advice to, to transfer a little bit of money over, make a deal with that, understand how it works, uh, you know, learn the system, learn learn about how how to put a deal together because you can you can put together a, a pretty nice deal with, with not a lot of capital. And it doesn't take a uh, hundred thousand dollars to to put together a nice real estate uh, deal. So, uh, you know, if somebody's starting with five or ten thousand dollars, they've got plenty of assets to do that if they uh, will take the time to learn how to do it. Sure. And uh, the question to follow up was, what is the minimum? We don't have a minimum at Advance. I would say typically someone would start with an account. Usually, with at least probably a thousand or two thousand dollars, especially if you're looking at buying real estate, just having enough cash in there to cover any escrow deposit uh, that you might have to put forward when you put that initial offer in on the contract. So, if you kind of know maybe the ballpark of what assets you're buying and what that escrow deposit might look like, that might be a good guide uh, as far as the minimum to invest. Well, um, if, if there's a new investor and they're just starting to invest in real estate, then they, they want to have a cushion, too. I mean, you, sure. the mistake people make is sometimes they'll buy, let's say it's their first house, and they buy their first house, and they don't have a lot of uh, money in the bank, and now they're under a lot of pressure to rent the first person that comes along, which, of course, is a major mistake. You, you want to be able to take your time in renting that first house and, and uh, you know, select a good tenant because – if, if you select a bad tenant, it may be your last tenant. You know, you may get back out of the business if, if you get a nightmare tenant. Sure. Well, let's get, get to our first question. Again, just those of you who are listening, if you have a question for John that you would like to ask, please just type it into the, the chat box on the screen, and we'll make sure to get to it. Um, obviously, IRAs are a lot of tax benefits of investing in an IRA account. Um, but even outside of the IRA, John, the question, first question is, how much of an impact um, does the tax ramifications of a particular deal influence how you might structure that deal, uh, and then how would you adjust terms to make that deal more pro more favorable from a tax perspective? Well, anybody in business knows that the only dollars that actually count are after-tax dollars. Uh, so not, not that you need to become a, a tax expert. Uh, I think it's excellent to have a, a CPA on your team that can give you good tax advice, but you need to understand how you're going to make your profit from any deal. And, and of course, if you if you can take out a profit tax free, that's that's the ultimate. Uh, in, in real estate, you have you have a couple different things working for you. One is the type of profits you take out, whether whether they're capital gains or ordinary income. 
uh, ordinary income, if you'd buy a house with some leverage today, would probably be sheltered by the depreciation. So you, you may not have any taxes to pay. You might be able to take the rents out tax-free. Down the road, a major advantage of real estate is that if, if you buy quality properties in, in areas that, that are, have some appreciation, is, is you wake up one day and you have a, a, a net worth. You might have a large net worth. And once you have that net worth and, and, and a growing net worth, you've got an option that, that most investors don't have, and that is you've got the option of borrowing against that net worth and pulling money out tax-free. Now, when you borrow, you have to pay it back, so you have to think about how you're going to generate the cash flow to pay it back and, and whether or not that will be taxable to you. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you look, take, take an extreme example, take a guy like Warren Buffett who has a billion dollars, many billions of dollars, but he never has to, uh, to earn any income. He can simply live off of money he borrows from the rest of his life if he wants to. You know, it would be easy for Warren to go out and borrow a million dollars or $10 million, and you know, that, you know he, he's not going to spend that much on his lifestyle. So if you had a, a $5 million net worth and, and you could borrow $250,000 a year on a regular basis because you had good credit, you could live off that $250,000 a year and borrow money. So well, part of this is long-term strategy. Part of it is tied to the type of assets we buy. Uh, uh, so, it, you know, there's, there's not a really a short answer here, but the, the second part of your question is how, how, how would you adjust the terms to make the deal more favorable in the tax perspective? If I was trying to shelter current income, then I would, I would have terms that would give me as, as, as much uh, in tax deductions today as possible. So rather than having an inter interest and principal loan, I would, I, would, I would try to have an interest-only loan. If I wanted to maximize my tax deductions and structure a deal so that I could deduct even more, I would structure a land lease so I could deduct the, the portion of, uh, uh, of the land each month, too, in addition to my, my interest, in addition to the taxes, insurance, and maintenance, and other things. So you can structure something for maximum tax benefits, but, but before you do that, sit down with your CPA, and, and this won't be the only deal you ever make. You may make 10 deals over the next 5 or 10 years, and, and uh, you'll, you'll learn more. You'll, you'll maybe change the way you structure things, and, and certainly that's an advantage of, of doing 10 smaller deals rather than just go out and buy one big building today and set things up, because then if your life changes and you just have one big building that's all set up, it's hard to restructure that deal. If you're, if you're doing a deal every year, you're doing a couple deals every year, you can reevaluate your, your income situation, your tax situation, and, and put, the, put together deals that, that you know, help you the most with your current situation. Yeah, you kind of maybe just started to touch on a little bit of that uh, on the next question here, but what deals do you, cre uh, what deals do, you do uh, to create cash flow today uh, versus those types of deals that you do to create more income for the future? And maybe which one of those, you know, would you do either of those kind of deals within an IRA account, or which one would be preferred for the IRA? Well, in, in my mind, the, the type of deal that works best in an IRA account it is, a, is a deal that would produce taxable income today if I owned it personally. And, 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 and if I want to avoid paying that tax personally today, and if I have money in the account to do it, uh, and that investment comes along, I would buy it in my IRA. And a perfect example, I think, is, is, uh, is something that produces interest income. Uh, as you know, I buy mortgages. I, I sometimes lend money. Uh, so, and and those, those operations produce interest income, which is hard for me to shelter. I can't shelter it with depreciation or other things on my personal return. So I, I prefer, if I'm going to buy something that has interest income, to do it in my IRA uh, because the IRA won't pay any taxes today, and if it's a Roth IRA, it won't pay taxes ever. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the type of investment you're looking at, if, if you talk about in the future, uh, you know, the, if you have an IRA, you can take the money out tax-free in the future. Uh, the, the money I like to take out long-term would be capital gains money. So uh, if it produces short-term taxable income, I'm going to try to hold it in the IRA today. If it's going to produce a long-term capital gain and compound, I'll probably hold that personally or, or an entity that flows through to my personal tax return. All right. Now, I know in the class coming up, you're going to be talking, or you or Pete, one of the one of you will be talking about kind of partnering up and looking, probably looking for financial partners as well. Um, when you partner up with somebody on a deal, on some, some type of an investment, do you usually structure that deal in a type of entity, either through a trust or an LLC, maybe a partnership? You know, what's your preferred uh, vehicle for, for partnering with somebody and, and why? Well, it depends on how many people are involved. 
the type of income it's going to produce, how long we're going to hold it, how much management's involved. So there, there's a couple of questions I'd have to ask about any particular deal. We uh, the last deal I put together with with a number of people was in an LLC that had five investors involved. They all made a significant contribution of capital. I managed the deal, so I, I I didn't take a fee. I could have taken a fee for being a management partner, but I was one of the principals involved too. Uh, and the LLC worked well because I, it gave me total control. Uh, as a managing member, I, I, I was able to make all the decisions without having any phone conferences or anything. I was able to buy and sell when I wanted to, and, and uh, it gave me control over the operation. So control is a major factor when you when you invest with other people. You know, if you and I take title and we're both on the deed and we're a little vague about who's going to be in charge, that could just be a, a messy situation if somebody comes along with an offer and, and you want more money, but I want to take this offer, what are we going to do? So it's best to have one person in control, and that could be the mem- managing member of an LLC. It could be the, the, um, the uh, uh, trustee of a trust. It could be the president of a corporation. It could be the, the general partner of a, of a limited partnership. So you, uh, you should have that conversation probably with, with, a, with an attorney if it's going to be a big deal. If it's a small deal, there's better ways to structure it. I mean, if you and I are going to buy a house together, you're going to put up the money, I'm going to manage it. We, we can probably do that in a simple land trust uh, without uh, spending as much money on legal fees. Uh, so, But, I mean, get, get, if, if it's your first deal, uh, you probably should not be investing with somebody else if it's your first deal. You want to make sure you have the skill set to manage and put together a deal, and the deal is really going to make money. Uh, because it's, it's, sometimes you see folks get started in this business and they go out and buy something that they think is a good deal but is not a good deal, and it loses money. Well, the, the worst possible scenario is to lose money with somebody else in there with you because now you've got two miserable people where you should just be miserable by yourself. <laughs> um, question to come up, so I'll kind of align this. Are there any particular types of deals that you, you like to partner on with other people, or you know, whether, it's, whether it's real estate, commercial real estate, loans or are you kind of open to partnering uh, with anybody on any type of investment if it makes sense well my wife's policy if it's a really good deal she wants to be my partner if it's not a really good deal i should go out and find somebody else uh so i'm, I'm buying two boats this week she said to go out and find somebody else she, she doesn't want to be my partner in the boats for some reason uh but but to answer your question honestly you know every deal is different and, and it depends on the, the, the capital i've got on hand uh, in an ideal world i would have no partners at all I would own everything by myself. I, I would have no conversations with anybody else. But, but when you're first starting, and, and, uh, and I've been doing this for a while, but the, probably the first 50 or 100 deals I was involved in, I had partners. Uh, I, I would find somebody else to put up the money. I would do all the work. I would find the property. I would manage it. I would sell it. And uh, we'd either exchange into another property or, or we'd split the profits up. And uh, that was a very successful formula for me, and, and we will be talking about that. But uh, today especially, there, there is a lot of money looking for a home. There's a lot of money sitting in the bank earning 0.6% looking for a higher yield. And if you have the ability and will do the work to put together deals, there's, there's never been a better time to put together deals with, with other investors' money. Uh, there's a lot of money, you know, in retirement accounts that, that – uh, Sometimes just sitting in cash and, and uh, doesn't want to be in the stock market, wants to be someplace where it can earn a 4, 5, 6, 7% yield, and, and real estate will do that pretty, pretty comfortably. Uh, today, I think because of the uh, relatively strong rental market, uh, the low interest rates, and, and we're kind of on the upswing on prices, it, it's a very safe time to buy. So, so I see more and more people getting into the market now. All right, uh, next question. Uh, when you're looking at buying a property using some kind of financing, do you have a formula you'd be willing to share that you you, you kind of just try to stick to to make sure that you are going to have some positive cash flow uh, for that property? So even after paying back the loan and other expenses, is there a certain percentage of financing that you won't go above on a property, or is it, again, deal dependent? Well, it depends on the terms of the financing. If I can get a 100-year loan, uh, no interest, I can get – you know, I can pay an awful lot for a property, uh, and, and I'm just using that as an extreme example. But if you're if you're thinking about a 20 or a 30 year loan, amortizing at today's market interest rates five, six, seven percent, then then you you can should be able to do this math. You, you should not buy a property, an investment property, uh, that you don't know uh, the the income and expenses on. So you you should be able to uh, guess pretty darn close about what it's going to rent for, and, and be conservative. Think it's going to rent for fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars a month? Use fourteen hundred. 
Uh, you shouldn't. You can look up the taxes. You can look. You can call your insurance agent and get the insurance. I use a number of about 20% of the gross income for a typical uh, expenses for maintenance, but that's not a. And you don't get that every year. I mean, that includes roofs. That includes uh, you know carpeting and and uh, uh, other, other things that that only happen every four or five years or every 15 or 20 years sometimes. So. Uh, an experienced landlord will have a better feel for this. If you just have one house, it, it's a little different question than if you have a dozen houses, because with a dozen houses, you can spread things out, you have better cash flow. If it's your first house, you want to have some kind of cash reserves just in case you have to put a new roof on in three years. And, and again, you try to anticipate those things. You look at the house pretty hard before you buy it to see if it's going to need any major uh, improvements over the next, you know, say, the first five to ten years. But if you if you buy one like that, you need to anticipate that and, and fund for it. But uh, I don't buy houses that don't have positive cash flow. So I, I will not buy a house unless it's going to make me some money each month. I don't I don't see the logic. Uh, I don't see why you would buy it. But like any investment or any business opportunity, why would you buy a business that loses money? It doesn't make any sense. So if you're going to go to the work to buy and manage a property, it should make you money each month. Now some of that money may be the principal pay down on a loan. But that doesn't impress me so much because, uh, you know, I may not use that for 15 or 20 years. I'd, I'd like to see some cash flow coming in today to compensate me for my work. All right. Uh, talk a little bit about owner financing. Um, you know, you're by, for those not really familiar with owner financing or seller financing, if you own a piece of real estate and you're selling it, um, you're basically providing you have a new buyer and you're going to provide them the financing. You're going to basically uh, hold the note and mortgage on that property uh, if you're considering owner financing, in what circumstances um, of selling a property do you consider owner financing and, and being uh, open to it versus times when you want to sell the property and just get the cash from the sale? Well, if you're a beginning investor, you're, you're still trying to build up your net worth. You have a net worth goal. Maybe you picked a number of uh, $3 million, and you pick that number because you know you can make uh, 6% on your money. And 6% of $3 million is $180,000 a year, and that's your income target. So you, you have some logic behind going for $3 million. Until you reach that $3 million number, first of all, you shouldn't be selling anything probably. But second, step two, when you make a mistake, and we all make mistakes, I've, you know, I, I don't own all the properties that I bought. I own, some, I own the first property I ever bought, and I own a lot of properties I bought back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But the ones I've, I've gotten rid of are ones I didn't like. They, they were high maintenance. They didn't attract good tenants. They weren't appreciating. Uh, so when there's, a, when there's a logical reason to get rid of something, uh, then you think about, well, I can either sell it, carry back a note, and generate some interest income, or I can take the money from a sale and reinvest it into another property uh, by using a 1031 exchange, and I won't pay any taxes, and, and I'll keep my money working, and I'll keep it building toward this $3 million goal. So I would tell people until you set your goal, and then once you set that goal, until you reach that goal, don't be selling properties and taking taking interest income. It, it, the interest income is not making you richer. It's just money you'll spend today. Uh, once you sell a house or, or a farm building or whatever it is and you carry back a note, uh, that note's not going up in value. And it's probably going to go down in value if interest rates go up or if we have more inflation. So you, you, what you've done is you've capped off your net worth at that point. And uh, even if you hit $3 million this, this week, and uh, let's say you're 60 years old and you've got $3 million, you, you still might have the thought, well, look, I may live another 30 years here, and $3 million is a pretty good nest egg today, but 30 years from now, $3 million maybe you know, might just buy one or two houses. So maybe I need to keep some of that money growing. So I'm not, I'm not a big fan of selling and carrying back notes until you know – uh, you've got all you need, and, and uh, may, maybe you're doing this part of a, 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 a way to help other folks, but you're financing houses for people to help them get into a house. But from a, of a strictly profit-making standpoint, uh, it, I don't think it's a very good strategy. Well, and I think, too, what you mentioned, you know, if you, especially if you're selling a house because you don't like it, because you don't, it's not easy to rent or not in the best neighborhood or whatever reason you're getting rid of it, maybe you wouldn't want to do owner financing because if the borrower defaults, that property is yours again. I would think that's another... That's absolutely thing. true. And if there's, sometimes you, know, you buy something and there's, there's problems with it, and you don't understand the problems until you get it. You know, and it could be a busy street. It could be a bad neighbor. It could be poor construction. It could be a bad lot. It could drain the wrong way, something weird, you know. And when you get something like that, you're absolutely right. You don't want to get it back. 
So, so the best way to get rid of it is to, to either trade it to somebody else who will take it. And uh, Pete and I will be talking a lot about that in this class, and it's about a fourth of the class. But putting together deals without selling, just by trading one property for another, is an excellent way to do business. And, and Pete and I, of course, have been doing that forever. Uh, that, that's how we grew up in this business. Is, is we we are we are both very active in exchanging groups back in the, in the 70s and the 80s, and, and made a lot of money because we we, we understand how to how, how to use that technique to make money, and, and we'll we'll be teaching that. Well, kind of next question touches on owner financing again, but just maybe in general, if you were doing any type of private lending, whether you're you're owner financing a property that you already own, or if you're just looking to create a new note and mortgage, um, are there ways you can structure that note that would enable you maybe to more easily sell that note to another investor if you so chose down the line? If they you know make it uh, more attractive to a potential investor down the line, you'd be if you had to, you could you could dump the note off off to. You know, you know, and there, there's a lot of institutional investors that, that are not banks, but they're, they're people like uh, First Acceptance Corporation. That, that, that if you've ever sold a property and carried back a note, they probably wrote you a letter saying we'd be happy to buy your note from you. So there are people that will buy. Of course, they buy at discounts. Uh, the the the, 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 the uh, quality of your paperwork will, will affect how much you'll get. So when I, whenever, if I would sell a house and carry back a note. I would use a standard Fannie Mae form mortgage, you know, all, all eight or nine pages of it, whatever it is. I'd have a lawyer or a title company prepare it. I'd make sure my paperwork looks just like a bank note so there, there's no shortcuts, or, you know, the, the paperwork is solid. So uh, if somebody did want to buy it or I wanted to use it as a down payment to buy another property, uh, some attorney could look at it and say, yeah, well recorded, the uh, title insurance is there, you know, it, it's a real deal. Uh, because otherwise you can create a note that doesn't have much value if your paperwork's not very good. The next thing is that if you've got a note that you've sold a, you know, you've sold a property to somebody and, and you just did it yesterday and, and you haven't received your first payment yet, that, that note doesn't have a lot of value because it's not seasoned. It, it doesn't have any track record. You know, People are not sure they're ever going to make a payment. So you're better off having a strategy to hold on to that note for, for a year or so maybe a couple of years, so that you can show a history of payments received because now you, you have something that, that makes more sense to people, and, and maybe the property is appreciated during that period of time. So now instead of having a, a 90% note, maybe you've got an 80% of value note, and there's more, more uh, security for the person who would take it. Uh, so, so all those things go into uh, play. The, uh, the thing that's most important, though, with, with any kind of note is the collateral. Uh, you know, what, what's it secured by? If it's secured by a, a house that's an older house, that's in poor repair, it's in a weak side of town, that note's not going to have a lot of value. If, it, if it's secured by a, a house that's well-maintained, that's owner-occupied, it's in a good neighborhood, it's an appreciating house, then that note has a lot more value. So, so you, have to, you have to think through this. And I've seen a lot of people create paper by buying older, junky houses and then selling them to somebody with a very low down payment and carrying back a note, and that can create cash flow, and, and that it requires, of course, some management. You have to go out and collect that money sometimes. People don't always pay you on time. But those notes, uh, although they produce good cash flow, don't have a lot of value in the marketplace. They're, they are harder to sell, and uh, you may be able to trade them to somebody who's got another property they don't want, but they would be hard to sell. So uh, the collateral is important. Uh, even even the person making the payment, uh, it, you know, certainly affects the value. So if, if they have bad credit, uh, you know, the, the perfect storm is somebody that has bad credit. It's an older house. They put nothing down. That that piece of paper is really not worth much to anybody. But if somebody has a good credit, good house, uh, relatively short term loan, and and the, and, and I'm, when I learned about balloon payments, I don't know if the folks listening understand what a balloon payment is, but you can you can structure a note so the entire amount of note is due in, in say five years. My my experience with over almost 40 years with hundreds of notes was only one paid off that had a balloon in it. All the rest of them got extended. So balloon payments, uh, you know, that the, 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 it's, it's a line in the, in the note, but they rarely pay off. Uh, just to reiterate, people are watching or listening, I should say, uh, get some questions in if you have them, because we're kind of getting down to the last couple here and winding, winding down the webinar. Uh, so just type those into the chat box if you have them. Um, now, you mentioned you, do, you like to do some, some lending within your IRA account. What terms do you like to put uh, within these types of notes, really, that are going to maximize the returns that are coming back into an IRA? And are there certain mortgages or loans that you would not do in an IRA, and, and why? 
Well, you know, we have a whole new body of law here in the last 10 years with the SAFE Act and uh, Dodd-Frank that, that regulate uh, lending to uh, users. So, so most of my lending is, is not done to people who live in the houses. They, they, these are investors I'm dealing with that are, are business loans. And, and when I make a business loan uh, to somebody, I want to make sure that there's enough income to make the payments. Uh, the collateral is important, uh, but but nine out of ten times, uh, you know, I, I, my, my preferred solution is not to take the collateral; it's to get my money back and get the interest on the money back. So, so you look at a couple things. You look at the uh, the uh, person who's borrowing its ability to manage the property. You know, if, if somebody is a new landlord, they've never bought anything before in their life, and they show up in my office and they, they're buying a ten-unit apartment building and they want to buy it with a five percent down payment. Uh, I'm not interested in that loan because they don't have the track record of, of managing a, that ten-unit apartment building, and that the tenants in that building may just eat them alive. They may not be able to make those payments, and, and I don't want to own the ten-unit apartment building. I don't want to manage it, so that's got that would have two strikes against it, and I wouldn't make that loan. Uh, if they if they come to me with uh, something as smaller, uh, you know, a group of houses that they're buying or one house that they're buying, and, and again, it's an investor loan, it's not an owner occupant. Now we don't have to worry about the, the Dodd Frank. And the SAFE Act as much, but what we have to do is, is be concerned with the, the collateral itself, the shape of the collateral, and again, the, the uh, borrower's ability to, to manage and, and, uh, and pay me back. Uh, so it, it, it's not a business that I recommend it to people who are, who are new at this because you want to be able to evaluate the real estate, and, and uh, you should be able to say to yourself, if I get this property back instead of getting my money back, I'll still be happy. If, you, if you're losing sleep, uh, because you're worried you're going to get the property back and study your money back, then you've made a bad loan, okay? because now you're in a bad negotiating position. So uh, the short answer to your question is, is, is I like to, to, to make loans against properties that I'd like to own, and that's not always the case because I'm really a picky buyer. You know, I, I rarely, uh, you know, I only buy a few properties a year because I just can't find the ones I like well enough at, at the right price. Uh, so if you're, if you're as picky as I am about buying, you'll probably be a pretty picky lender too, and that makes it more of a challenge. It's, uh, it was, it's a great challenge for me to, to get a loan place that I like, uh, that's secured by properties that have good enough cash flow and are managed by people that know what they're doing. Uh, but once I find that combination, I'm happy to make the loan. Now, as far as terms, you know, the interest rate is not nearly as important to me as getting my money back. Uh, and so people that charge high interest rates, 18 20%, they generally are, are dealing with riskier borrowers. And uh, I, I would rather have a 99% chance of getting my money back and collect 8 or 10% than have a 50% chance of getting my money back and be collecting 16 or 18%. So uh, you can see there's a relationship between those two things. So, so my interest rates are generally a little bit lower than some of my competitors, uh, but I'm really picky about what I'll end on. All right, uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in, but I'll get to the last question I had, and it ties into one of the questions that's been asked by uh, another individual. But... Uh, if you could just explain maybe a little bit of the basics of uh, obtaining buying a property subject to, um, and what an individual needs to do to protect themselves if they are buying a property that is subject to existing financing. Well, if there's an existing loan on the property, and you're taking title subject to that loan, uh, certainly you want to read the, uh, the, the the terms of that loan. You want to read the note and probably read the mortgage to, to, to see what you, what what you're taking subject to to make sure there's not any. Uh, uh, clauses in there like a very high uh, late payment fee or, or uh, you know, uh, other, other things that may cause you trouble. You, you should understand that taking subject to any kind of institutional loan, uh, you know, probably it gives the lender the right to call that note due if they want to. Uh, so that, that puts you at some risk. So, so, again, a new investor probably shouldn't use this strategy to acquire property unless they're just buying something with a very, very low down payment and they're willing to take a chance. The person that really is at risk in these subject to deals is not the buyer, it's the seller. You know, if you sell a house and let somebody take title subject to your loan, you're the one that qualify for that loan. You're the one that uh, put your credit at risk and signed a note and mortgage. And if these people who you sold to don't make the payments and they lose this house in foreclosure, it's going to go against your credit record. It may, it may affect their credit record if they're on a deed, but it's certainly going to affect your credit record. So, so for somebody selling a house subject to a loan, uh, they would have to be confident that the person buying that house had the ability to make the payments. You know, was a good manager. 
maybe was putting some cash in the deal or, or would give them some extra collateral to make sure the deal worked. And, and, and I've bought a number of houses subject to over the years, and uh, they've all worked out. We've never had a default. We've never had any problems with the lenders. Uh, but we've always made our payments on time. And, and uh, I, I hear a lot of war stories about people that have had problems, and typically they don't make their payments. Uh, or the payment changes and they make the wrong payment, or they don't keep it insured, or taxes don't get paid. You know, some, something goes wrong that, that uh, sets off an alarm down at the, the lender's office, and, and they get all excited about it, and they see that their collateral or their, their money is at risk here because the, uh, either collateral is not being maintained or uh, you know, the payments aren't being made accordingly to the, to the note. So um, there's problems. So it, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a strategy that works. You know, I've, I've certainly been teaching people to take subject to for years, and I've done it myself many times. So I understand how it works and that it does work. And it works in certain situations where, where the people who, who own a property typically, uh, you know, they're not in a position where they can make any more payments. They're going to walk away from this house. You know, if they walk away from it, and it goes into foreclosure, that affects their credit. So if somebody else can start making payments, uh, that might improve their, their, their credit. One, one technique we've used uh, a number of times instead of taking subject two is to simply lease option a property. If you've come to me and say, look, I can't make my payments anymore, and we're leaving town, and we just hate to leave this house behind because we know it's going to go into foreclosure, if I can make sense out of it, I would make them an offer to lease that house from them for the next 10 years, uh, for today's mortgage payment, so I'd make the payments directly to make sure they were made, with an option to buy it probably at a couple thousand dollars higher than what their mortgage balance is today. Because if I can't find a way to write them a check for a couple thousand dollars in this deal, they uh, they may not show up and sign a deed. So I, I want to make sure this, this transaction works without having to go to court and try to enforce it. So, so by structuring it with a lease option, that gives me the right to make the payments. It, it stops the foreclosure, but they know their payments are being made on time uh, because they still own the property. If I start making their payments on time, that's probably going to improve their credit, you know, especially if they've been making payments late for a couple of years. Uh, and it, it's a solution uh, that, that requires pretty simple paperwork, a lease option. Uh, the deed stays in the seller's name, so there's really no risk of, of foreclosure without their knowledge. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a way to take subject to without transferring title and, and uh, without putting the seller at risk. All right, John, let me get to a couple of questions here and uh, get things wrapped up. But uh, someone just a quick question, uh, tax-wise, if you were buying a property and you, you end up selling it and taking a note back, what is your basis on that deal that gets reported to the IRS? If I'm buying a property and then I sell it and take a note back? Correct. Okay, well, then when I buy the property, I establish my basis, okay? So if I buy it today for $100,000, and uh, if I sell it the next day, my basis is still $100,000. Uh, if, I, if, I, if I own that property for five or ten years and depreciate that property, which I'm required to do by law, then my basis is going to go down each year unless I make a capital improvement. If I put a new roof on it, I capitalize it, or I put a pool in the backyard and I capitalize it, then, then that adds to my basis. So... You know, it's a calculation that, that you know you, you can you can get a the master tax guide published by Commerce Clearinghouse has a pretty good explanation of that. Uh, one of my students, a guy named Jack Reed, has written a number of books on on taxes for, uh, for real estate investors. So there's there's a if you know nothing about taxes and this is a fairly basic tax question, you should you should study a little bit. You should you know not not take a CPA course, but but read some basic uh, tax. Uh, law as a as it applies toward real estate, so so you kind of understand the concept of depreciation and capital improvements. Uh, but so you know your the short answer is your basis is going to change if the you hold it. Uh, so okay. I don't know if that answers the question or not, but <laughs> makes sense to me. Um, now a couple things on the subject too. Some uh, wrote said they're looking, uh, they're finding quite a bit of trouble in finding a title company not wanting to open escrow on, on subject two. Is there any suggestions or to keep looking on that type of deal? Well, you can use the lease option like I recommended, or okay. you can do the subject two, and you can just have them write it on the title policy as an exception, the, uh, the loan. And, that, and that's the way a title company will handle it. They'll, they'll, they'll accept the loan. They won't, they won't insure over that loan. Uh, if something goes wrong with the loan, their insurance doesn't count. Uh, but, you know, if you take subject to an existing loan and make a small down payment, say $5,000, the lender has a title policy for the amount of that loan. 
Everybody follow me on that? So, you know, if somebody bought a house for $100,000 three or four years ago, and now they're selling it for one hundred and ten, dollars and you're, you're going to buy it from them, and it still has a $95,000 loan on it, that $95,000 loan is covered by the original title insurance policy that the lender has. So the only only risk you're taking as a buyer is the difference between the the you know the time that the person bought it and bought had a title policy for the lender and, and today. Uh, so you can you can have somebody do a title search. You can hire a real lawyer to do a title search and see if there's any claims against the property. And if there's none, you don't you don't need to buy title insurance for a, to protect a very small amount of equity uh, over a short period of time. But again. Get a lawyer if you're going to do that. Make make sure you're getting good title. Make sure the people signing the deed are real people. Uh, you know there is a lot of fraud in the business, so you want to make sure you understand the risk involved and, and uh, cover yourself. Um, and kind of just following up on that question, I'll jump back to another, the last one we have. But somebody just kind of on basics on the subject too. They said, why would you sell a house with title subject to an existing loan? Isn't it easier to simple to sell the house and require the buyer to get a new loan? Um, if you can just explain to an individual why people sell subject to as opposed to just the new buyer coming and getting a new loan. Well, I think if the seller could sell and then require the buyer to get a new loan, that would most of the time be their first choice if they understood, uh, you know, if you understand the, the risk and, and selling subject to a loan. I certainly, I, w- I would never sell a house unless somebody else takes subject to a loan that I had personally guaranteed. I just wouldn't do it. So somebody who understands that and has an option probably would believe the same thing. Now, some people don't have an option. Most of the houses I've bought subject to are in a, in a market where they're having trouble selling, uh, where they owe almost the full value of the house. So they might owe 125 on a house that's worth 130 or 135, but you know, almost 100 percent financed, and they're behind on their payments and they're leaving town and they're just going to walk away from this house. Those are the houses you typically can pick up subject to by giving them a, a fairly small amount of money and uh, just taking over their loan. Because that they're gonna they're gonna walk away from it in, in either case, you know they're not getting anything else out out of it. So th- those are the folks you'll typically sell subject to. If somebody has a large equity, if somebody has a small loan, if somebody has really good credit, uh, they're not likely to sell to you subject to. All right, uh, last question we have here today. Uh, kind of switch gears from the res- more probably residential. We talk about more often into commercial. Uh, qu- the question asker, I guess the attendee wants to know what are your thoughts on. Uh, absolute triple net commercial investment properties for a first-time real estate investor. Well, if you can afford them, that'd be a lovely thing. Um, you know, mo- most triple net leases and, and uh, investment properties are not inexpensive. You, you're not going to find a, you know, a hundred thousand dollar house that's triple net leased to somebody. So, if you want to buy the Buffalo Wild Wings franchise for for two million bucks and, and uh, you know, be happy with a six percent return on your money, uh, you, you can find that deal. Uh, there, there are some risk, you know, and I'm not picking on Buffalo Wild Wings, but, you know, let's pick on Sears. Let's say you buy a Sears store. Uh, you know, there, these, these folks who have signed these uh, triple net leases are typically businesses. Uh, not all businesses succeed. Some of them are going to fail. And uh, if you had a, a Sears store and, and Sears shut down and you end up with, a, you know, an 80,000-square-foot retail operation, uh, it may take you five years to find another tenant for it. So, so it's not all all great news. Uh, I would say to you, if you're really considering something that looks like a triple net lease and you're just getting into the business, just just go out and buy an REIT stock. That's what they do. They go out and put together those deals. And now you've got professional management uh, that's, that's looking at these deals. And, and of course, you're paying commissions when you do that because the guy in charge is getting paid a salary and there's commissions getting paid. But chances of you losing money with an REIT are probably a lot uh, probably a lot slimmer than, than if you went out and put together a deal yourself. I've been involved in a number of deals like that. I've structured deals like that, uh, and some of them work out very well. But then, on the other hand, I've, I've seen buildings sitting empty for two or three years. Uh, so unless you've got the holding power, to, 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 because if you let a building sit empty for three years and you run out of money when you sell it next time, you're, you're probably going to take quite a beating. So, so you want to make sure you can afford something like that. All right, well, John, I think that's all the questions we got today. I want to thank you again for coming on and just reminding everybody that John's uh, upcoming class that he's been referencing a little bit throughout today's uh, question and answer is uh, coming up on April 25th and 26th in Tampa. Uh, you can register at his website at johnshop.com, and there are discounts available if you register before April 15th, and then also if you register uh, along with somebody else, and you get a discount for getting two of you in that same seminar. Just to reiterate, we will be there on the, I think that Saturday as well, and be on hand and helping uh, 
sponsor the event uh, with Pete and John. Uh, so again, that's April 25th and 26th at the Tampa Airport Holiday Inn. Uh, and you can go to johnshaub.com. That's J-O-H-N-S-H-A-U-B.com. S-C-H-A-U-B. S-C-H, I'm sorry, S-C-H-A-U-B. Dot com. It's correct on the slides. That's what. That's good. important. So, okay, that's good. Again, John, thanks for joining us today, and I uh, look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Well, thanks, Scott. And again, it, you know, this is not a class for beginners. So if you're just getting started in the business, you can you can get on Pete's website or my website. We actually teach uh, classes for beginners too, but th this is an advanced class that so we'll just teach once every four or five years. So come, come if you if you feel like you're ready for it, and uh, okay. look forward to seeing you there, Scott. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, John. Bye bye. Bye bye.